puedo verla, Nava? My nickname on Twitter is Sir Darkat. Uh, I like Twitter, so you, I, I will I read more than I write, but I'm there. <laughs> I like web security stuff. I like uh, hacking stuff. I was born in Mexico, but I've been in Zurich for around uh, six months or so. Um, I work in Google security team with like Mickey and uh, Mr. Albertini and so on. Um, I'm Hackpra All Stars, and uh, thanks for the invite, Mario. And okay, so this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, anyone knows what this is? Any guess? Service workers. They are service workers, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but they are not. They are not any type of service workers. They are a very special type of service workers. They are uh, good-looking, no, and they are uh, web service workers. Um, so, the, this is the agenda of the presentation. So, first, I'm going to start talking about why we are here. Um, some obvious abuse scenarios, uh, some potential use cases for security defense, uh, some potential use cases for security offense, and uh, a brief conclusion. Uh, does anyone know, how many people are familiar with service workers in general? Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll, a couple of you. So I'll, I'll give a brief introduction, uh, maybe 10 minutes or so on how it is, but I'll try to go a little bit fast. Um, okay, so why are we even here? So the reason that service workers exist is because uh, people wanted to uh, use Twitter on an airplane. And uh, if you try to, if you're on an airplane and you try to go to Twitter, this is what happens. And uh, you get a very cool game that you can actually play in your phone if you don't know. But uh, it's not Twitter. <laughs> so uh, a lot of time ago, maybe 10 years ago, uh, Gears uh, was created as a product to try to solve this problem. And that kind of set the foundation to where we are today. So I'll mention it briefly. So they had three things, a local server, a database, and a worker pool. And all of these things didn't exist in the web uh, 10 years ago. So a local server was essentially a way to serve local files, like an Nginx server, server running locally, but uh, that worked as the origin of the uh, site running. A database, which was a SQLite database. At that point, we didn't have local storage or anything like that. And a worker pool, which essentially was for threading um, in JavaScript. And one very important thing to mention is that it was a plugin. Like you had to install it, and then it worked in your browsers. But you had to install it. And that meant that it wouldn't work in, in all cases. So uh, as is usual uh, with Google, <laughs> it was canceled a couple of years later. And uh, the reason was mostly because uh, most of these features made it into the web. So they were standardized as IndexedDB for the database thing, and as web workers for the non-database thing, and application cache. And application cache was the thing that was supposed to be like the local server thing, but uh, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. So app cache. Um, app cache, essentially how it works, and it still works today, is that it's a list of files that will get cached offline. And it's just a, like a super cache, and, and so on. And, and it allowed some web applications to uh, be built, but it didn't ga gain much, much traction. And you can see it simply by the fact that Twitter still today is not uh, available on an airplane. And uh, some guy called Jake Archibald, uh, who is the uh, main service worker guy, uh, wrote this, this, blog, this blog post, so this article called, called Application Cache is a Douchebag. And essentially, the summary of the whole presentation is that uh, the, design, the design of Application Cache was kind of uh, flaky. And it can only do one thing. And so it's like a Swiss Army knife with, that does the same thing again and again and again. That's what that means, I think. Um, and this was done like just within one year of uh, application cache starting to gain a lot of, uh, a lot of popularity. So the, the way that he introduces uh, his, his article is, is so funny that I, I really wanted to put it there. And I will summarize it as uh, he is in a party. And then uh, there is a bunch of people, and then no one knows each other. And then there is this girl that says, like, hi, my name is Dev. And I actually know, do know one person that is called Dev, so Dev is a real name. And uh, so what do you do then? And then he's like, oh, I'm local store. And he's like, oh, he's just a shelf. And, uh, and then this application cache comes in and says, like, hey, I'm like, I'm, I'm application cache. I turned your life experience from suck ass to success. And uh, just, just, just one file and bush, and et cetera. And essentially what Jake was trying to, the point that he was trying to make is that he knew application cache better, and it actually is not as good as it, as it made it sound. So uh, he wrote a spec for service workers uh, within the same year, I think. Anyway, so before we go to service workers, there is something else that are called workers that I went into a little bit of detail before. And workers are essentially JavaScript threads or something like that. And they work, essentially, the, the, the way they work is like you have a website, and then the web page can spawn a 
like another execution context, uh, another global JavaScript scope. And then you communicate with it with post message, and you can trigger as many as you want, and then you have workers, and then you have shared workers, and shared workers are shared across multiple uh, web pages, and, and so on. So they, that, that was essentially what are workers. And shared work and service workers are, he had the idea of like, why don't we just use workers uh, to serve the application cache, like to give them a programmatic API rather than a declarative one. So that's what service workers is. So the web usually works like that. You have a website and a happy cloud. And then uh, with service workers, you have uh, the website, a service worker, and then the happy cloud. And uh, the service worker is kind of in the middle of all of these requests. And the service worker has several events. And uh, there are five main events, but uh, several of there's more uh, for there is an extensibility platform. So you could have more in the future. So there's five main things, as I mentioned. Um, Prefetching, that means before the website is even started to get accessed, when the browser thinks that the user might want to go to a website. The other one is with navigating, when the browser has committed to go to that website. The other one is sub-resources, so once you're in a website, all sub-resources, including cross-origin resources, will go through the service worker. Uh, background sync, that means when the website is going to go offline, it might want some operation to happen. And uh, push notifications, that means when the user is not online at all, maybe uh, an, an external website will, a, a web server will trigger a notification and spawn your web worker. It's very interesting. So uh, I, I made this very cool animation that it take, took me like maybe one hour, which uh, I'll see if it works. So the user types twitter.com. And before he presses enter, the service worker is instantiated. It's called install. Uh, then the user navigates, and then he goes to Twitter. And then the service worker is instantiated. Then all of the sub-resources, like the logo and the sub CSS and et cetera, are triggered. Then the background sync, like as soon as the user clicks tweet for woo, uh, the service worker is spawned. And the user exits the website. And sometime later, uh, Mario mentions me on Twitter, and then I get a notification. I, I don't remember what this tweet was about, actually, but uh, it happened. All right, so uh, service workers before can only do two th one thing, which was cache resources. Now they can do two things. They can read complete request information, and they get great control over the response and requests that uh, are, are being made. And I'll give two examples. So the first one is the user is trying to post a tweet to Twitter, <laughs> and uh, the tweet says would. And uh, the service worker essentially is instantiated before that happens, and it can decide whether to forward it or not. And Twitter never knows about this request. Uh, this is something different that before was not possible, because before it was impossible to know a post body of a request. Like uh, you could, the, the web server could know it, but not JavaScript code. And this is something that now you can do, because uh, it's like a proxy. Like a, a service worker becomes like a proxy. Uh, another thing that the service worker can do is like whenever there is a request, it can respond with whatever it wants. It can respond with another request uh, from another related resource, or it can respond with a, with a file uh, that it manually created, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's very interesting because that uh, allows for request trafficking that I'm going to get into in a minute. So uh, there's a couple obvious things that come to mind when you start thinking about service workers. And most of them were addressed by the spec authors in one way or another. Some of them were uh, accepted as Cela vie, and uh, we will see. All right. So uh, there is. So I read a lot of specs. Uh, I, I I don't know why. I, I just find them like very relaxing. So uh, but there is this uh, section in the service worker spec that uh, explains in the security considerations that says service workers create the opportunity for a bad actor to turn a bad day into a bad eternity. And that's like the most poetic phrase I've seen in a spec. <laughs> and uh, it's it's I, I'm very happy that uh, Jake or, or or Alex or whoever did it uh, put it there because it's like a, it's very memorable. And uh, let me explain more or less what they were thinking or what I think they were thinking. So uh, the, once you have a service worker that works more or less like that, it's always in the middle, right? So now it's, it's supposed to work when you are offline, which means that the website will never get requested even when you are online. Or to rephrase that, what that means is that if there's an XSS that allows you to install a service worker in some way, then the website will never be able to recover from that. Or that was the problem they were trying to solve. So to mitigate that, they, re they, they restricted the number of ways that you can register a service worker, which I, I'll go into in a minute. But uh, imagining that you, once you have a service worker installed, there are several things that you can do. One of them is that you can use uh, denial of service via cookies. Like you make so many cookies that when the request happens, the server cannot respond to it, which works in all uh, web servers. And another, way, another thing that you can do is that you can, uh, if the website tries to unregister you as a service worker, you just 
stop that from happening because you're the service worker and you can say like no. Um, so yeah, I, it's it's very. That's what I think. That's what they were thinking. So they introduced a couple of things that try to kind of mitigate the number of places that could result in total punish. Um, all right. So workers across borders. So I want to explain this. So I'm from Mexico, and I, I, I live in uh, I live in the U.S. and I have to leave the U.S. because uh, I couldn't renew my visa and etc. So I really care about this uh, immigration thing. And I, when I was looking at the uh, way that same origin policy and workers and uh, sub-resources and et cetera works, I realized that it's very similar to immigration, and I'm going to explain this here. <laughs> so uh, as an embedder or as an employer, you trust the third party or like the third country national with some of your rights and privileges. So for example, if you hire someone, that person could do a lot of bad things in your name. Uh, it doesn't, the, the employer or the embedder doesn't get any privilege over the, over the third party of the, over the person, it cannot like kill it or something like that. And uh, but you get to specify one thing, and that one thing is the type of work that they will do. So, for example, if you are like this company that uh, employs a designer called Foo.CSS, and employ like an engineer called Foo.JS, and a salesman called Foo.Swift, and uh, uh, I don't know uh, someone else called Foo.HTML, then you can mess around and say like, okay, now the designer is an engineer, and now the uh, sales, now the engineer is a salesman, and et cetera, and et cetera. And that usually doesn't really matter, but uh, in this case, in HTML, it does, it does matter. And that leads to several uh, types of attacks, especially for plugins, uh, things from the very, very beginning with Billy Rios and uh, Gifar, to very recently to Rosetta Flash, for example. And essentially, the, the, it's the same, more or less, uh, side effect. So the way, the way this matters is because a script source and new worker behave in two different ways. And one of them is that the script source runs in the context and the origin of the caller, like of the embedder of the, of the website doing script source, while workers, share workers, and service workers run in the context of the hosting site. This means that if you could spawn a worker, then just simply hosting a file that kind of looks like JavaScript, that works as JavaScript, will be able to do very bad things, like uh, you know, all of the things that I talked before. So to prevent that, what uh, the browsers did is uh, create a very strict immigration port, uh, policy, <laughs> which means that uh, you are not allowed to outsource uh, workers. You are only allowed to outsource uh, script source and sub resources. And, and the reason this matters, then again, is because you will not be allowed to spawn a service worker from a different uh, origin, and uh, which because that will mean that that will be a problem. Another thing that they enforce is uh, content type, like you have to have the right content type. And, uh, and that's it. And, and when I mean the uh, same origin, there is one thing that it's important to mention, which is that if you have a way of, ha of hosting a JavaScript file in the same domain, in the same origin with the right content type, then it usually will mean that you will be able to install a service worker once you have an XSS first. You, this is a stepping stone. Uh, however, there are a couple cases where that actually does happen. One of them is JSONP. And that's what we're going to talk about. That's actually the logo of JSON. And uh, I was looking for JSON on the internet, and I didn't realize that there was a JSON logo until uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday. So anyway, so JSONP. Um, in JSONP, you're allowed to issue one call. And workers have this call called import scripts. And import scripts essentially allow you to, it's like an include for uh, in other languages. And what you can do then is like if you can import, if you can make that call, then usually you just get object object. But if you get an array, you can get to control it, and then you could do something like that. So that could be one way that you could do it. Um, the other advantage of import scripts is that if you are able to host such a file or you're able to do it, then you're able to bypass X content type options, uh, no content type checks, and no same origin check, no same origin policy checks, which means that uh, you you can bypass all of these fancy things. Another thing that is interesting that I forgot to mention just now is that there is this other way of creating uh, files that are in the same origin, which is via the blob and the file system uh, APIs, which you just have URL dot create object or something like that, uh, and then. That gives you a URL that is same origin. Uh, in Chrome, this used to work until very, very recently, and now you, don't, you, you have to be same origin, but it still works with redirects, for example, and it will work with import scripts as well. So that's kind of interesting. Anyway, so that's how they mitigated all of these issues. Uh, Man in the middle attacks are also something they were very concerned about, and they tried to prevent it with um, SSL. But anyway, so let's say that uh, Man in the middle kind of worked. So one thing that you, once you have a service worker, uh, now the Man in the middle becomes a service worker, right? And what they can do is that they disable all security features, like they can disable CSP, they can disable extreme options, and so on and so forth. So even if a website thinks that they are secure against uh, inline or whatever XSS, once you have a service worker that is installed, 
they can disable all of those features, which is important because some people use CSP for uh, sandboxing purposes. So you can disable such sandboxing policies. Another thing that you can do is that now you have like this type of ghost texts, which means that it's something that uh, it's, it's instantiated without you having to visit any website. And it's just, it's just running there in the background without you being able to do anything. Uh, so yeah, uh, they mitigate, they, they try to prevent you from be getting installed in the first place with uh, SSL. And, and most of the things were based on, most of these defenses were based on trying to protect the XSS, the XSS uh, stepping stone attack. But the thing that is, I find the most interesting is what you can do the other way around, which I'll get in. Oh, I haven't finished. And directory based isolation. The other thing that you can do is that uh, most, there's many websites like JSB or JSFIDL or like uh, universities that allow you to host files in the same direct, in the same origin as other files, but uh, you are separated by a directory. So the service workers people realized this was a problem. So they, they only allow you to be, uh, to install a service worker for the path that you, the service worker resides on, unless you have a header. And that's also, the, the analogy here will be like a cubicle, like uh, maybe directories are separated by this very thin uh, control, but uh, in, in, in reality it's, uh, is no real security control for service workers at least. They made it so that if someone decides to put like a jungle in front, uh, it only affects that person, not everyone else. All right, so uh, that's how they tried to fix most of the, of the issues. And, and they did more or less a good job. Like there is some gotchas with import scripts and file URLs and et cetera. But in general, it's not too bad. So there is, before I go into the other type of attacks that uh, go the other way around, one thing that is interesting to mention is that service workers can also be used for security and uh, for defense, and it's kind of interesting, or it might be interesting if you think about it. So one of them is CSRF. Uh, the most obvious idea will be like, okay, so now you have a service worker, uh, you can just prevent the request from being done in the first place as a service worker. And uh, before the post tweet happens, you can just stop it. The problem is that this doesn't really work because uh, the sub resources only, th this only happens for sub resources within a, a page that you were installed. So a third party page can just fetch it without you getting instantiated. At least today, uh, they might change it in the future. But what you can do is that you can force at the cloud level that all requests must have a CSRF token and then you connect with the service worker. Uh, but o o otherwise it's not very useful uh, for CSRF. Another thing that some people might think of is XSS. And for XSS, maybe you actually do have a chance to do some things. Um, one of them is you can, you can create an XSS filter for Firefox because they are the only browser that doesn't have one. Um, another thing that you can do is that you can kind of force all requests, all navigational requests to, be, to, to arrive via the front door. Like you, cannot, you can make them not arrive via, uh, like you cannot, you can, I have an example. So you can, maybe the tweet uh, handler shouldn't be accessible to external users. Not because of CSRF, just because of XSS reasons, for example, or just mitigations. So then the service worker could be like, okay, you don't seem to be coming from a client that I know of, so just go to a, just a GTFO, right? <laughs> Um, and then Twitter never gets to see it, so there is no CSRF. Another thing that you can do is content security policy or extra options things uh, sidewise. So for some websites or for some web applications, it's very, very difficult to set up a header across the whole application. Um, it might be simple for some websites that have a, a, a single home, single server thing, but as soon as you get very complicated, this, is very, this becomes almost impossible. So with service workers, you could actually do that. You could just resource service worker that uh, just set up, sets up a CSP or uh, extra options uh, response on everything that it doesn't know about. Another thing that you can do, which is also a little bit interesting, is that once you are installed as a service worker, uh, without having to change the HTML of the page, you could lo like sandbox all of the JavaScript and all of the sub resources that are being uh, returned to the user. Uh, and that's also kind of interesting because you could like sandbox like Google Analytics or something like that that everyone seems to complain about. Um, all right, so uh, some potential attacks with service workers. So uh, some of these, uh, I, while I was investigating series workers, I found some bugs. Uh, I'm going to present the ones that are, that I will not uh, feel bad about uh, speaking publicly. Uh, so one of them is uh, script errors. So the script errors are usually not, uh, are usually supposed to be only leaked same origin. And the reason for that is because if there is a string that uh, is included as a JavaScript file, then that the string could uh, trigger a, a reference error which says like uh, CSRF12345 is not defined. And these, are, uh, these type of variables errors are only exposed to same origin requests 
for exactly for this reason, because otherwise a third-party site will be able to read in a limited way some of the code of another website. So the way that they restrict it is if the URL is uh, is same origin, then uh, include it. However, with service workers, you can just say like, oh yeah, I'm totally uh, giving you the request for uh, foo.com uh, or from the same origin, but actually it's a response from a different website. And at that level, the browser doesn't know that this response comes from somewhere else. So that's an attack that you can do. Another one is, uh, this works in Firefox, but in Firefox, uh, anyway, this is interesting. Uh, the way that they, you can leak content types, and while you cannot know the actual response of a request, you can know uh, what content type it returned, because depending on the content type, it returns a different value. So while you might not be able to read the actual data uh, in the render response, you can see like, okay, this was an image, or this was a, a, this thing or another. It's not very serious. Um, another thing that works is that font faces are supposed to be same origin for some reason. And uh, you can do exactly the same thing I, I said in the script. They, you make the request for a same origin font, the service worker intercepts it and responds with a cross origin font. And like, essentially you bypass the same origin restrictions. And you could have more bugs and that you should probably investigate by your own. <laughs> um, there's another thing which is request trafficking that, or that I call request trafficking, which uh, I'll give a couple examples. So request trafficking means that you can make a request from one API that issues requests in a way that you like it, and then use that response of that request in a different place. So uh, one example is Beacon. So there is this API called navigator.sendbeacon that you al allows you to put uh, any website and then allows you to send the post data to that URL with any content type. So you can make a post request with any content type and then you can intercept the response and put it anywhere you want. Like you can put it in a style sheet, in a CSS file, in a script tag or whatever. As I mentioned earlier, right, you can uh, issue a request for one thing and put it in the whatever sync you want. Uh, another thing that you can do, for example, that uh, we found, well, I found to uh, be useful in a couple of cases, was that uh, you can, so before it was not possible to get a script source, for example, with a post request. Uh, I mean, it was just impossible, or a, or a flash file, or something like that. Now, with service workers, it's possible, the service worker just intercepts the request for a script source foo, and then just responds with a, re with a response for a post request, or a head request, or something like that. With head request, it's very interesting, because you can respond with empty strings, uh, which is also very, uh, annoying uh, for the server. You can also make requests with overlong uh, URLs, with overlong headers that sometimes allow you to control the, um, the error message. So it can say like the, this, the, anyway, there's usually error messages that then you can respond and then you might be able to control some of the response, uh, like be able to read HTTP only cookies or so. Um, and you can also read redirects because of, so CSP allows you to read, CSP violation reports allow you to read uh, redirect chains via the uh, CSP thingy. And before, you were only able to do it for uh, sub-requests. Now, because of service workers, you can do it for any type of request, including like post requests, put requests, et cetera, uh, including for course and non-course requests. All right. Um, and the last one, which is uh, the most interesting one that I, I think, <laughs> is that you can uh, mix and match, which is uh, range responses. And range responses have, there are two things to talk about this one. So one of them is there are some requests, like for images, downloads, audio, video, uh, and so on, that uh, will issue requests with a range header. And range headers, if you don't know how it works, is that it says like, okay, I want a little bit of this, uh, of this request, and then it makes another request. I, I want a little bit more, a little bit more, and so on and so on. So uh, the, the server, uh, the, the client, makes a request for a range header, and then the service worker will like, oh, yeah, 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 sure, this is the response, right? Like, the response from zero to three is foo. And then uh, this, the client is like, okay, thank you very much. Now I want uh, from three to six. And then now this response goes to the real uh, web server, for example. And then the real web server responds with like, bar, this will get ignored, blah, blah, blah. And it will get ignored because I already told him that the full, um, so this six means that that's the complete content type, the, co the complete content length. So it will ignore everything after the six, essentially. So as at the end of the day, you have a response that mixes uh, same origin with cross origin things, which is kind of interesting, uh, but, I don't know, like you can do a lot of things, but I haven't been able to figure out super bad things that you could do because of the things that you're allowed to put the range headers on. Um, oh, and uh, there was recently a, a blue screen of that in information, internet information services uh, bug, and you could only do range requests, uh, same origin. Uh, with this, you, for example, you could be able to do it cross origin. Um, all right, so I went a little bit fast. I don't know how, what time it is, but uh, uh, when I practiced this, I did 45 minutes. Uh, I think today I did 20 minutes again. And this happened last time as well. <laughs> like, this is terrible. <laughs> um, 
like, I don't know if you remember, but last time it was exactly the same. Uh, and I had, anyway, it doesn't matter. So this is more or less what we talked about. Uh, script verbose errors, info leak, content type info leak, font face, same my pass, content security policy, letter click, fast system URLs at workers. Those, the, red one, the red things are vulnerabilities that probably will be fixed. Um, the orange things are attack uh, ideas, like ways that you can use HTTP for random stuff. And the green things are different stuff, like uh, CSRF prevention. Like, you can say, like, uh, you are only allowing, you're, going to, you're only going to allow requests that come from uh, uh, visible uh, uh, frames, for example, or uh, origin one HTTP headers, sandboxing all the JavaScript that everyone has ever, everyone always asks for, uh, limiting navigation, etc. cetera, uh, a programmatic API for a CSP, et cetera. All right. And um, I, I actually, most of these things I did it just with a, uh, uh, Chrome has this very, very useful uh, debugging for service workers. So I was essentially putting breakpoints and writing things down. But at some point I realized that uh, that was, taking me too much time. So I made this very little laugh that uh, you can take a look at. I, I only use GitHub for this thing, so you can take a look. Um, all right, so this is now Q&A. Apparently I have like time for 25 questions. <laughs> um, you can, I have questions, ideas. Uh, can you do blank with service workers? And uh, the answer is usually going to be probably yes. Uh, I might have forgotten to talk about some of the things that I said here. Uh, I, I hope not, but if I did, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll explain. Uh, and uh, was this just a plot to play a village people music video? And you should ask me that question. All right. Any questions? Did I, I speak too fast? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so did you bring this up with Jake Archibald? And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, this, was, this has been a while. Uh, it, most of these things, as I mentioned before, like they, they took care of most of the things. And uh, they did a very good job. Uh, however, there's a compromise that has to be made between uh, usability and, or, or I mean developers and like new uh, exploitation vectors and it's cool. I mean, they, they know the consequences and uh, that's okay. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yep. Uh, just a follow up. Uh, there, I don't know, but has there been any discussion on controlling service workers from CSP? Yeah, so uh, ser actually C CSP, service workers issue, okay, it's complicated. So service workers are clients which means that they are bound to CSP. They are like, it's comp but they are, they are bound to CSP, essentially. And uh, so import scripts could be limited via uh, CSP, for example. And then for actually making the request for a service worker, there is a service worker uh, header that then you can respond, uh, that you can 403 if you want to, for example. But you can say, this allows service workers. Yeah, you will have to do it at the HTTP, like, you, can you have to configure Apache so that it receives a, re a request with the service worker header, it 403s it. Um, but that wouldn't work for things like a file system API or blob URL or something like that. But uh, it might, I mean, that's a, that's a trade-off that they did. There is a long post from Jake um, where he explains like uh, a pu public service announcement, announcement uh, service workers are coming, and these are all the things that all developers in the world now should know. And I don't know how many people have actually read that blog post, but. Uh, you should read it, probably. <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Anything else? Yes? Uh, so is it feasible, I guess, to, to, to use service workers? Uh, like, let's say you have an XSS, you create a new service worker, and then you can do many the browser via that? Yes, uh, but you need to be able to do either the import, import scripts trick, or uh, you have, have to have an open redirect with like the file system thing with import scripts or something like that. But uh, just having a, a single XSS, they try to prevent things as much as possible uh, with these uh, headers and uh, same directory thing and et cetera. Uh, same for man in the middle, like it has to be over SSL because uh, if you go to a coffee shop and you install a service worker, that will be terrible. So it's only, it's only accessible for SSL. Cool, yep. Uh, will it be possible to combine the range trick with the script error leak? Uh, oh, the script error leak. So uh, it's complicated. So one of the reasons that I was mentioning that it's it's kind of tricky to do the range header thing, is because the type of things that uh, issue and respond to range headers are kind of limited. So you might be able to do it for some sub-resources, but not all of them. So for example, images, audio, video, uh, downloads, etc. you definitely can do it. And downloads might be bad because in some browsers they run same origin, but uh, the, it's not always the case. So uh, script is not one of those that issue or accept range uh, res requests or responses. Or both, essentially. Cool. Yep. Can you share a link to your slide? 
Uh, yeah, uh, it's, I, I need to do something about that. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> they are only images, to be honest, but yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I, I don't have much uh, content, but... Uh, the rest of the game is interesting. Okay, yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, all right. Anything else? Yes. Was this just a plot to play? Religion? Yes, exactly. That's <laughs> excellent. Thank you for asking. It doesn't work. No. But anyway, yeah, the answer is yes. Oh, I think Mario has a... All right. There we go. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, you can <laughs> All right. That's your computer. <laughs> that's it, really.